Hey, welcome back to part two of two of the resin epoxy coffee table build. If you haven't seen part one, I recommend clicking over to watch that one. However, if you want to jump straight into all the sanding and finishing, you can feel free to start right here. I don't think most people really know how much time is involved in all this sanding, finishing, and filling these little spots. So I'm going to give a pretty detailed overview of how I do this. And what I'm doing here is this is CA glue or also known as super glue. And what I do is I touch up a little spot, hit it with an activator. In about 10, 15 seconds, I can touch it up again, sand. And I basically spend a day doing this. And this is the black CA glue. Um, works good on the black epoxy. I don't like doing it on the wood because it tends to stain the wood a little bit. But basically, I just go over, start sanding with 100 grit, touch it up, move a little bit, find a new spot, touch it up, move a little bit. And I just keep doing this hour after hour. If you're curious what I'm sanding this on, this is a Festool vacuum clamp. It's a pretty handy little uh, vacuum clamp, so you don't have to actually put any firm clamps into your wood, which can damage it or kind of compress it or mess with your sanding. And uh, as you can see, it's just a ton of this CA glue activator, scraping it, sanding it. And I start with 100 grit, and that's a pretty good way to kind of get it nice and flat and just find all the little imperfections that need to be touched up. And I really can't underestimate how long this takes. Um, but if you want to just have a nice, perfectly flat surface, this is what you have to do. I do do all my sanding with a Festool sander and a Festool vac. And it's a HEPA vac, so it really keeps the dust down. And sadly, one of my most asked questions is, where do I get the sandpaper storage bins? And they're not actually for sandpaper storage, but I'll include a link below to where I get those. Uh, moving on to the sides, I make sure to use a really firm pad. If you use a soft pad, it'll tend to round those edges. So I have the hardest pad you can get for that and just try to go nice and easy so you don't end up rounding over those edges at all. Of course, you do want the edges rounded a little bit. And for that, I use an eighth inch router bit and it gives just a really nice, clean uniform. I used to just kind of hand sand it, but it's never that consistent. And if you do this eighth inch round over bit, it'll give you a perfectly consistent rounded edge. And I should have a trim router. It's one tool I actually don't have. So I end up doing the corners with a uh, rasp just to get that nice, consistent eighth inch round over. Uh, after I do hit it all with a rasp and the router, I'll go back through and hand sand it to kind of remove those uh, little chatter router marks. I generally prefer a sanding sponge when I'm uh, trying to smooth out these corners. If I don't have that, I'll just grab a piece of paper like I did here. Uh, and this, at this point, I've only sanded the top to 100 grit, and I'll come back and go through my entire progression of 100, 120, 150, 180, 220, 320. I did make an entire video dedicated to just the sanding and finishing process. I'll include a link up in the corner if you do want to click on that now. If not, you can kind of get most of what you need from this video, but that other video is pretty comprehensive with everything you need to know. There is one different thing between this and my finish video is this is the first time I've used the Osmo 1101 and it's supposed to provide a little bit more penetration and therefore better protection from, you know, watermarks and things like that. I haven't tested this finish out yet. Uh, I've tested the regular Osmo and it usually does pretty good, but I haven't tested it with this thin 1101. Looking forward to the results though. I really liked uh, how well it penetrated and absorbed into the wood. I should say that it's very important to finish both sides. You don't want to let it set overnight because that can actually cause the wood to cup and warp as one side absorbs moisture and the other side is finished. And people always ask, well, doesn't it leave marks when you put it on the other side? And the answer, of course, yeah, it does. But you sand them out. And then on your next coat, you can finish just one side, let it set, you know, for eight, 10 hours and then finish the other side. So I do like to get one coat of finish on the entire thing uh, in under an hour. And that'll kind of prevent any type of unwanted warping or cupping. I've had a couple tables that uh, cupped on me overnight and you had to redo the entire thing. It's pretty frustrating. And with this Osmo 1101, what I did was I let it set on there, kind of a little bit standing liquid on there for about 30 minutes. Then I came back with these blue shop towels and wiped off all the excess after about that 30 minutes. I let this 1101 dry overnight before I came back with this 3043, which is the real uh, top coat kind of final finish you're going to be applying. And no need to sand between coats between the 1101 and the 3043. When you're applying it, you really just want to buff it in. You can do it by hand, or you can put one of these white pads on your orbital, orbital sander. I have a gem orbital, and it's an automotive sander that has kind of been adapted for woodworking. Once you have it pretty well buffed in, you flip that pad over to the clean side, 
start buffing until you basically don't see any lines or swirls left and then you just let it set overnight and it will give you a really remarkably beautiful finish just um, by buffing it in in a dusty shop you don't have to worry about dust nibs it's really really cool i did warn you in part one that i found a pretty bad problem with a bit of softwood and i didn't notice any of it until this finish cured and i came back and i saw these discolored spots and they were just wood that was too soft and I didn't notice it. And I'm really disappointed in myself at this point because this table was almost ready to go out the door. Just had maybe another coat or two. So had to start from scratch and just take it out with a wire wheel like I did on the slabs in part one. And it's, uh, you gotta, you gotta take a breath. It happens. It's a little bit frustrating, but it really needs to be done when you're doing, you know, really nice furniture that your clients are expecting a premium level product and it's just part of the process it happens and it's not the end of the world but it was a couple day setback in the end i was really glad that i went ahead and replaced this wood because as i carved this out i found out there was actually a little cavern underneath and i don't think the table would have you know collapsed or anything but i definitely wanted to get that wood out of there replace it with more epoxy and that's one of the cool things about doing these epoxy tables they're a lot more forgiving because there's no right or wrong way in how much epoxy needs to be in one of these tables as long as it looks kind of natural i basically touched all this up with a fast drying epoxy and then i came back with more eco epoxy and filled that cavern with more black epoxy so it really wasn't too bad but yeah it took me a couple extra days that uh, shouldn't have taken me and I uh, used the injector here, just shot it right in, overflowed it a little bit, and I ended up taking it and sanding it all the way back down uh, with that big planer sander that you saw in part one. So it was a bit of a process, but uh, got it where we needed to be, and when it was done, I was really happy I did that. I ended up only taking off about a 32nd of an inch to get it back down to just perfectly flat, bare wood again. But when you bring it down, you expose a whole bunch of new little tiny imperfections. So... You might remember some of this from the start of the video, just a ton of CA glue sanding, filling more spots, more sanding, filling more spots, rounding the edges, the entire process over again, back to the 1101. And this time I was actually brushing it on because I was getting a little bit more product. This, it was really thirsty wood in the end. It ended up absorbing quite a bit. So I ended up brushing this on, let it set for 30 minutes or an hour, and then came back and wiped it all off. I'll spare you having to watch the entire finish process again because it's exactly the same as you saw before. I will also include that link, though, if you want the, a more detailed explanation. Uh, but going on to the uh, base I decided to get with this, this was actually the client and I kind of worked together to come up with this base idea. Then I had it custom made from a local guy here. And luckily for me, he did an exceptional job. It was perfectly fit. I left it about a sixteenth of an inch undersized on all sides, so there was just a little bit of a gap. You can see there the table's perfectly flat. This uh, table base is perfectly flat. You so he's a little worried that something's not gonna line up, but everything worked out really well. And if this is your first time watching one of my videos, welcome, I really appreciate you watching. And if you like what you see, please hit that subscribe button or comment with any questions if I haven't been clear on anything or if you just wanna let me know how I'm doing so far. What I'm doing here is just lining up the holes to drill for the threaded inserts. And I use these little, uh, zinc threaded inserts I get off of Amazon it's like seven bucks for 50 of them or seven bucks for a hundred of them they're really inexpensive and they're actually go in a lot easier than you might think uh, you can see some of my holes aren't perfectly vertical but they just always seem to line up exactly straight when I thread them in and you can see I have a little dab of wood glue in there it's not entirely necessary I've heard of some people saying that there's a backed out on them I've never had that problem but I do a little bit for lubrication and just to make sure they stay put these ones are the easy lock threaded inserts and they say they're for softwood. I do not like their hardwood ones at all. And this is definitely a hard walnut wood. So don't worry about buying the softwood ones because they definitely work better for hardwood. Before I send the base out to powder coat, I want to do one quick test foot, make sure all the bolts lined up. And of course they did. And once I got it back, you can see the client went with kind of a bronzish brass type color. And it actually wasn't my first choice, but I think it went with the client's space a little bit better than some of the other colors. But I'd love to hear in the comments what you think of the base color that they went with. It took me a long time to learn how to take decent photos in my garage. And the first step is getting a good paper backdrop. If you do want a full photography tutorial on how I take my photos in my garage, I'll include a link up in the corner now. But you can see I did some with a white backdrop. And here in a second, you'll see a few that I did with a black backdrop. And 
I really like the way the black backdrop one, this is a light painting technique. It's a, not something I invented, but it's something I use a lot with my uh, photographs because it really encompasses the entire table. It's hard to get some of the larger tables. This wasn't too bad because it was only a coffee table size, but some of the larger tables are really hard to get enough light on the whole thing. So I'd love to hear what you think below on which photo style you prefer. And thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Again, if you like this, please subscribe for more videos just like it. Have a great day.